folks. Friday afternoon, July 1st. Welcome to July, folks, here at Think Tech Studios uh, overlooking downtown Honolulu. Ted Rawlson here hosting your show, our show, all of our show, where the drone leads, used to be where the road leads. Uh, joining us from California is John Mullins from Promia, CEO of Promia, uh, incorporated in San Francisco. John, welcome aboard again. Hi. Thank you. Hi, Good hi John. <laughs> John's a frequent flyer on this show. I think last time you were on the show, John, we did 45 minutes. We're down to half hour now because we're much more efficient than we used to be. Anyway, uh, we talk about where, where droneism is headed on this show. We have guests here, we have hardware on the table, and we have people from around the world joining us. Uh, but right now, the role we play is we, the two of us, John, you and I in the studio here, are the one thing that's separating the entire citizenry of the state of Hawaii from starting off on its three-day holiday weekend. They're <laughs> obligated to look at this show and give us feedback. So we are it. We are holding them hostage right now to a whole weekend of rivalry and, and, and fun. Anyway, uh, John, welcome aboard again. Uh, always a pleasure to have you. And the reason there's nobody else here in the studio is we're going to be talking about something that very few people are discussing. Last week we had the studio full of students. We've had all kinds of people here talking about drones in their positive way, how we use them, how we enter contests, and how we have them in educational programs. We're going to talk about something here that is uh, not talked about much, but we really need to think about it. It's the whole game, the whole gamut of counter-drone, or anti-drone, or drone protection, or keep your drone where it belongs, and if it gets in the wrong place, I want to do something about it. That's a whole issue that's starting to become really important to uh, public safety people. Certainly the fire departments in California are very aware of that, the police department here and such. And uh, anybody who really has a, a piece of infrastructure, a hotel, for example, or something, or a power plant, is going to be interested in knowing who's flying drones over my place and what are they doing. So, John, uh, from your position, sitting, watching over a lot of the development of the in the information technology at the cutting edge in the world and uh, network uh, intrusions and such and cyber issues. How do you see the counter drone domain shaping up? Well, I think for months, maybe years, we've been thinking uh, counter drone is uh, to protect privacy and to protect uh, maybe safety and protect um, things from cameras, taking pictures, et cetera, press events, things like this. But uh, uh, now the terrorists have announced to the UN that they're building weapons drones, unmanned uh, killing machines, uh, which raises the detection and the defense to a different level. Um, so it, it, it's always been serious. Now it's more serious, kind of. And, you know, and, and then there's a, a kind of a continuity between a uh, quadcopter drone versus a fixed wing drone and then you go up the chain and now you're doing mortars and uh, those little missiles that they fire in from Gaza and then you know and, and you, there's all flavors so when you're talking defense especially against a sophisticated um, group who's intent to kill you uh, you have to look at all of it. And so what we see is an escalation then as, as we, we could all see it coming it's, it's gonna happen sooner or later and whether it's uh, for just frivolous, malicious issues or for serious terrorism issues, drones are gonna enter the picture sooner or later. That's right, that's, that's right. It's a yeah. hard thing to admit, isn't it? it it's, you don't wanna say something like that because it's, it's kind of putting a negative twist on something that's so positive, but, but there we are. So we gotta pay attention to this and get ahead of the curve, ahead of the wave, and, and do the preventions that we can. And uh, in some cases, that's, uh, that would be based on legislation and, and, and uh, uh, national law that would say you've got to put some uh, uh, geofencing in the software, you've got to put uh, other uh, automatic uh, registration features and such like this in the software so that you can't operate it unless it is truly validated and vetted against the registration of some kind. Uh, on the other scope, uh, other end of the scope is the issue of detection and tracking and identification when something's actually flying uh, in the air. And then at the end of that, we gotta figure out what to do with it. Do you go find a guy who's flying it or do you take it down? Do you freeze it? Do you drop it? Exactly what do you do? There's a whole range of things that can, that can apply here. Have you, what have you seen, John? I think you were involved in a Rose Bowl parade earlier this year. Yeah. Uh, what, do you, what do you see about the elements of technology that can come into this picture to deal with either the prevention of the flight in the wrong place in the first place or the detection and the 
identification once they're up? Oh, there's a whole bunch of different ones. There's, there's uh, different kinds of radar and uh, detection, remote detection, radio wave. Uh, there's also video analytics from advanced cameras that can see miles and can uh, detect the pattern and the movement of a different kind of drone and can identify it from that. And then there's also uh, like SHIPS, AIS, the automatic uh, information system that uh, requires that they each can broadcast their unique serial number uh, upon request. So those are all things to help do detection and, and protection. Uh, but, you know, if it is actually a very strongly suspected that it's a weapon or some sort of explosive, you're going to want to take a little bit stronger measures like blow it out of the sky rather than... Uh, others. So, uh, you know, it, it is based somewhat on the situation of what's happening. Okay. And so what we really have to do is figure out how the actual users, being the law enforcement people, the public safety people, or perhaps the uh, environmental people, uh, folks who have the responsibility for maintaining uh, security and maintaining normal operations, we got to understand what their limitations are in terms of how far they can range in, in terms of uh, in installing or injecting new technology into the system. Work backwards from what they can actually do and then decide how to roll that into programs and concepts that can go forward. We certainly don't want to be in a situation where the technology uh, is out in front of the ability to actually apply it. That's right. So it sounds like demonstrations or uh, Work at workshops and, and this sort of thing where, where we actually expose, we on the inside of the industry expose the users to what is available and have a dialogue that grows with uh, the, the courts and such involved at the same time. And everybody understand what the issues are and what can be done and uh, come up with a, a, some kind of a plan forward. Right, also what can be done, uh, who is authorized to do it? <laughs> you don't have regular citizens, you know, shooting uh, shooting things usually um, but uh, you know so so each one of the different responses really falls into a different category of who's authorized to do that which also you know you'll have more of that kind of activity on a border situation I think than you would in in an island situation for example so uh, there's, there's a whole number of factors to the whole topic this sounds like something that Department of Homeland Security would probably have a, a lot of uh, 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 influence in, in terms of affecting the, the future thought and, the, and directing the conversation. And, and NORTHCOM, you know, the U.S. NORTHCOM. North interesting, yeah. Well, that means PACOM out here. PACOM and NORTHCOM yeah, are partners. Right. That's really an interesting... Uh, now, you know, interestingly enough, I'll be uh, speaking at a, at a PACOM conference in Reno a month from now, and the subject is uh, the National Guard, Western Pacific states, including uh, the Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, maybe Arizona, uh, with working with their partner nations. Uh, in the case of Hawaii, Indonesia, and the Philippines are our partner nations, and each state has partners in the National Guard setup. And we've been talking about this kind of a subject, so I, I think that I might be able to actually uh, turn to that body and get maybe a first level of, uh, of requirements or needs or what could actually be done. With That'd the, be wonderful. You know, that would be wonderful. We can um, stir that together. You'll, you'll be at JIFIX that same week, I suspect. That's the I first week so, of yes. August. Yes. Okay, so we can get some requirements there. Uh, I, I would guess that the across the country, the uh, local police departments and such all have uh, extremely wide uh, variety, variation of what they're thinking about here, what their knowledge is and what they're thinking about, what their limitations and such are. Maybe the uh, National Association of the Chiefs of Police or something like that would be a good place to turn to as well here. I think that would be excellent. Um, and then, in some cases, the uh, regional uh, high patrol in the different large states, those are all, all good, good areas. Um, we did have some uh, questions in this area, what, about a year and a half ago from a couple of small towns on the East Coast, and we wrote down their requirements. They didn't go forward with any kind of uh, formal program, but we were collecting them, and I think, um, I think that's a very good idea. Okay, I'll, I can start that. Also, we had a recent, uh, recent conference with the National Fire Prevention Association group, and uh, also in Nevada, happened to be in Las Vegas a couple weeks ago, the NFPA. Uh, they generate standards for firefighting and for thread and couplings and pressure and pumps and things like this on apparatus. Uh, there's a dialogue going on now. Uh, should they not establish the standards for UAS use and protection against UAS, uh, use it against them? Uh, in the fire services, and so we're, we're involved in that dialogue right now, which is uh, not the policing action, but it's yet another aspect of public safety where 
uh, where drones can help and also have to be controlled and policed. So well, that's, yeah. a, that's a, another one. Now, I say all these things like I have all the time in the room to go do this stuff, right? But we, need to, we need to get people watching this show to become parts of our team and, uh, and bring in ideas and bring in connections and bring in uh, your network friends and let's figure out how we can work this problem. Sure. Also, anybody has a, a program of record, a sponsored military program with funding, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, spend, so, spending other people's money is a great thing, isn't it, John? And, and well, we can do it on our own, but is this going to take a little while? <laughs> how much, uh, much counter-drone interest is beginning to show up in GIFX? It's been a year since I've been at GIFX, so I'm quite out of date. What can well, you say about you, that? I, I kind of had a little watershed moment about three or four days ago when I read that article from the UN about uh, terrorist organizations getting serious about developing their own automated weapons from uh, unmanned vehicles. And uh, so that kind of changed things for me. So I haven't actually floated the idea. I guess I did send it to Northcom. I did send it to DHS. Um, and so now I'm kind of trying to get more activity going on those things. Well, GIFX is, uh, would be a logical uh, testing ground for some of these ideas. Well, one of them is, is uh, you know, you've got four or five groups you've been dealing with, Ted, and I just talked to two of them today about testing at GIFX. So, you know, because we've done a lot of, you and I have done a lot of drone testing at GIFX over the last couple of years, and we've never done any counter, and here's some products that are basically ready right now to demonstrate. So uh, we could bring them into August even. I think what we should do, that's a good point, John. You know, the network we've got going here, we've got Clay uh, Inskeep and his uh, uh, right. radar-based system. We ought to in introduce him to GIFX. Yeah, that's what I did today on the phone. Okay, all right. Okay, good, good, done deal. How about uh, Bill Ross and Drone Detect? Have you uh, had a chance to hook them up with GIFX? No, I haven't talked to them yet. I'll, I'll get on that one next. Okay. That, it, actually, GIFX would do us a great service if it could take on that role as well as the pro aspect of drones that it has been taking on. In fact, facing DHS the way it does at GIFX, that's a, a perfect place to have that kind of workshop. Right, and uh, got some very close friends at FEMA who are very interested in this area, and they're right there in um, Oakland, the Region 9. So, uh, you know, that's not too far to go down there to Camp Roberts uh, for that. So I, th I think that's a very good idea. We'll have to see how fast we can move on it, but I'm pretty sure we've got time. Yeah, it's only a month away. and. Uh, uh, but that's, I think we could get Bill Ross down there. You can probably get Clay down there. And uh, that'd be a, it, it, of course, you gotta get registered at GIFX. And if you're transmitting, you have to go through all the forms in terms of what, you know, FCC clearances and such on uh, things you're gonna transmit. So I've done this already for our current exercises. Okay. So, yeah, you, you're right. There is a lot to do. I, I'm not sure if we, we really hump it, maybe we can get it in. Yeah. Because you're not only gonna have to do the detect, you're gonna have to, um, publish all the uh, standards, all the communication specs for every drone that you're going to be detecting. <laughs> so that's there too, you know. Okay, this is, uh, but here's some, these are some good ideas that are forming. Let's uh, take a, a minute here during a break and think about how they might come together in terms of specific directions we can take right after our first break here, John. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. to discover what is likable about science. We bring on scientists of all ilk, astronomers, physicists, chemists, biologists, ecologists, and they talk about their work, and more importantly, they talk about why you should talk about their work, why you should think about their work, why you should like their work. I help them bring out why their work is understandable, why it's meaningful, why people should care about it, why people should support science. We have a good time. We talk about current uh, events of interest. We talk about uh, historical events sometimes. We dig deep into their research, why they do, what the joys and delights and frustrations of their work are. And in all, we, we tr show a, a real world of science, a real world of likable science. I hope you'll join us every Friday at 2 p.m. need to do for acquisition Here program. we are, folks. Ted Rawlson back live on our show, the last segment of our show, Where the Drone Leads, the last 15 minutes between you and celebration of the July 4th weekend. You're obligated to watch the rest of the show, and, um, and then you can go off and celebrate. Uh, joining me on the show today, we have John Mullins from the CEO of Promia in San Francisco on the Embarcadero, where the sun is setting by now, I suspect. And John, welcome aboard again, one of our frequent flyers on this show, and one of incredible breadth of ideas and wisdom 
uh, in those ideas. We're just talking in the first uh, half of the show here about the emerging recognition that counter drone, uh, which is the detection, identification, tracking, maybe even the defeating of drones, is going to be a really important part of the drone business. In fact, editorially, I should point out that at this very table sitting right here about three months ago was Gretchen West of uh, Hubble, uh, Hogan Lovells, uh, one of the law, large law firms that uh, generates drone business in the, in the world. Uh, one of her analyses based on, uh, on the strength and quality of investment going into the drone business was that counter drone is going to be one of the three durable legs of the drone stool. The other two are going to be image extraction and analysis and such, which we all expected. And the third leg of that stool is going to be training. But counter drone, right in the middle of the other two in terms of the main stream of business, uh, John, over the, over the years ahead. So what we were looking at was a, 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 we talked about a number of different aspects of, of technical systems in terms of sensors that can pull together information that indicates drones are going on. Uh, Somehow, this information from unstructured and, and uh, multiple sensors has to be brought together into a picture that has a high detection percentage so we don't send people off on uh, fool's missions here chasing things that aren't real. How, how, in your mind, since you do so much of this kind of uh, integration work, would, would you think that a multiple sensor system would be structured for plug and play so that it the information from it can be deduced into activity about drones? Very good question. Well, because it's such a new area and that you don't have a, a standard interfaces, you don't have standards defined, um, the first ones are going to be ad hoc to, to some extent, but there's some standard interfaces. For example, uh, DHS just sent out, I think today, a very important um, outreach. Uh, and what it was was their... Um, they want all critical infrastructure systems to be able to have two GPS uh, references, not just the current production GPS, which is the military and the satellites and everything else, but an alternate GPS in case the first one goes down for any one of a number of reasons, because GPS can also uh, sync timing and it, it actually has, it's how you bring everything together. So in building a new system right now, the wise component is to put two in. And you know, there's a Russian one, there's a, there's a US one, there's lots of different technologies. There's actually, in a lot of these little mobile devices, you've got a gyroscope in them and they remember where they've been. So if they ever get a, a sync on a date time stamp with a latitude longitude, then they remember every millimeter in every direction where they go. And even without radiating, you can ask them eight hours later, where are you now? And they know exactly where they are and uh, they know where they've been, <laughs> which is even very interesting. So there's lots of different technologies, but the point is they've asked today for all people that build critical infrastructure to put two systems in, which is very interesting. I, I didn't uh, see that, uh, that announcement from DHS. It indicated they were starting on a program to develop those second systems. Did, they not, did it not? To some extent, yeah, but they, but what basically I read I've been out researching and you can find about five or six other systems that are in various stages of being global, including the Russian one, which has their own satellites and everything. And it's a, you know, and Apple is actually uses both. In every Apple device, you got both the, the US and the Russian already built in, the chips. Um, so not, not all the Androids, but a lot of them, um, basically. And then you've got, uh, you know, the Arduinos, which are the um, little internet uh, of things uh, node that's patterned after a phone, but it's not a phone. It's based on the, Ar uh, the uh, Android OS, uh, but it's not a phone, but it's a, it's a little set of solenoids and any kind of push-pull you want to make happen. <laughs> and those, they all depend upon geolocal timing to know where and when things are, you know, to many decimal places. It, it goes out very long uh, so that you can actually gauge uh, things in flight, including jets, to see how fast they move from one place to another with these, these time clocks, right? So, um, so th it's critical, and if, if that ever was uh, compromised, then a lot of the infrastructure is gone. So now to uh, better shore up, it was a very intelligent move. I, I'm amazed, <laughs> no, excuse me, <laughs> that it's being required. And so now uh, we're putting it in, right? So what, I think what you're suggesting is that the, the fact that that recognition occurred and that action occurred, and which means somebody had to sell it, someone had to provide budget, someone had to convince their bosses, that's not an easy sell, something like that. Right. That's like a negative thing that has to be sold in order to remain positive. But that has occurred. 
I, I think what you're suggesting is, John, with that as a model, the issue of counter drone could follow a similar path in terms of recognition of the consequences and the criticality, and then we have to go do something. Is that what you had in what sure, you meant by sure. that? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, there is a, um, a big uh, game theory spreadsheet from NSA called the Grand Challenge Problem, and what it does is it has every possible movement that uh, a blue team could do versus every possible movement a red team could do and how they're all mix and match. When somebody does this, then you can do these three things or these four things and a, a good thing to do is this and then back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So that's how you can uh, deduce, um, like you say, commonalities of uh, requirements and capabilities for the all options to a game. So what we need is we need a, a, a challenge of some kind, a police challenge a counter drone police challenge that could be played on a national scale that would result in a uh, high probability detection and reasonable range half mile or something like that operating in the rain operating in the t steep terrain flat terrain uh, uh, hilly terrain and uh, vegetated terrain whatever for terrain you've got cost. for a reasonable cost that's yes, right big and, it, and it, it, it resides the software resides in the in the uh, software package already on the cruiser or maybe right. a small additional uh, a module is plugged into it somehow. Uh, minimum training so that the officer who is responding to whatever the call may be can also determine the drone aspects. Um, not much cost and a very high probability of detection. So we detect what's really there and not give reports on things that aren't there. Right. So uh, this is the sort of thing that we have to think about in terms of uh, what the requirements might be as a local police department might put them down. And right, well, some, are, some of them are fixed to buildings, like a stadium or a, or a perimeter or an oil refinery, and then you've got a fixed area. But you're right, some of them are mobile, some of them are responder, especially fire. You move it to a fire, you want to see everything around the fire, you want to see the winds, you want to pick up where the direction of smoke's going, you want to see if higher winds are coming to shift it quickly in another direction, all of those things, I would think. So, uh, yeah, different, a different set of requirements for the different first responders. So we, need a, we need a very brilliant architect on this thing, John, maybe you, uh, <laughs> to, to structure how, how this would go. Because again, the question I asked that you were, uh, I haven't answered yet, is how do we integrate all this stuff, all these sensors and all their information together, timestamp them, uh, deconflict them, correlate them, and turn them into a, a, truth, a, a true story? Uh, it, well, it's, if you're Remember the uh, IC Bernie uh, tool, the Integrated Chemical Nuclear Biological Radioactive Explosive Sensor. What they have on the back of that, David Lambsdorff, if you remember David, yeah. uh, wonderful, wonderful product, wonderful tool. But he has, there's a set of uh, DO, uh, I'm sorry, um, DHS uh, message bus for correlating different kinds of events from different kinds of sensors. And it's already predefined. It's already a DHS standard. And he has this implemented in his back-end component and he's offered to let us license that again at a fee uh, as part of some of these technology and it not only does what you asked about it also will filter the information and correctly distribute it to uh, FEMA and uh, Defense Intelligence Agency and the DEA and all the other ones who have needs to know on some of the data so it's a very powerful system and it was built to all the DHS standards so that's a, a sort of a uh, a bunch of algorithms, perhaps, or a bunch of other uh, pattern recognition systems that, that extract uh, that sort of information from unstructured and, and multiple type of sensors. Right. So yeah. And some of them, in David's case, some of them are particle sensors. So many particles per billion in the air of certain kinds of explosives will uh, will set off this one sensor, and it's very lightweight, and it can fit on a drone, and and all of these things. So that's another kind but i guess after you get one event one alert from a particle sensor one from a camera event maybe the analytics saw facial recognition or something and then one from other types of sensors the message bus that connects all of them and correlates them is a dhs standard and david already implemented that so oh, we need to get david in on our on our our external blog is going on here talking about this problem that's right that's right and, and dhs would like that a lot and you it would fit right into yeah. any of those programs. It would fit right into the FEMA, uh, SBB, STTR, and SBIR programs. So uh, I, I think there's a good case to be made there. That's interesting because you can sort of have a, a standard open architecture of some kind and as the sensors change and mature, as the th nature of the threat changes and matures, the same frame of reference continues to do the processing. You just change That's the right. sensors and 
have de different detection factors in, in that. We have, we have a product that does that in the security realm. Um, and then uh, David does in his event management realm. And this, you know, there's a lot we can do here, but it is changing and there is no one standard. And there's different companies trying to be that integrated component. One of them Cisco, one of them Juniper, you know, at different levels. They've got some very advanced new products. And, uh, and all the energy groups are trying to be the infrastructure for the Internet of Things, the reference infrastructure. And uh, so it's a battle. <laughs> okay. So when, what we're talking about is this uh, computer on board Honolulu Police Department's cars that detects drones flying at the park down here or flying where they shouldn't be. Uh, we have to include all the prior conversation in the solution set, but we can't let that uh, dominate the, uh, we can't let that complexity dominate the expression of the, of the, of the solution. We've got to have this thing down very simple so that, it, that drones or no drones and uh, uh, indications of where and uh, maybe even some indications of how much more flight time they've got if there's some way to sense what the particular unit is and based on some table lookup history of it, uh, how much, uh, what its battery life is. Well, there is a standard, that DJ interface, that's uh, becoming a standard on a lot of the quadcopters, uh, which can be uh, queried, you know, it's these sorts of things. But, uh, you know, then there's the whole concept of cracking into them and, and reading their avionics from the crack. And then, as you point out, maybe finding something about their batteries remotely. I'm not sure how you would read that, but it's possible to know how much more charge they have left. You know, yeah. there's all those things. But the other one that I'm, you know, thinking is is the different speeds of drones, because some of them are fixed wing, they can go a lot faster. And, um, you know, some sort of defense that's being used today in, in the military is a laser response that can uh, work with the video analytics and the camera. And you see a drone over here at three o'clock that the laser puts it out. I mean, that's, that's quick and, and and it's not an explosive in the sky. Mm -hmm. So so we have this set here. We have this 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 uh, predicament. We have a, a known problem. We can see it. We can't determine all the different elements of that problem, but we know what the root of it is, and that's either fixed wing or rotorcraft drones of some kind. Uh, and we have various kinds of sensors. We've got radar. We, I held a pound and a half or a pound lidar in my hands today, which I think would fit this picture very well. We've got acoustic sensors. We've got uh, radio. Uh, RF in, in interception right. and detection, and you get the ability to, some, in some cases, read the codes uh, on the drones, and you probably have the ability to attempt to download to a drone to determine or to change its behavior in some way. So all these, all these chunks of action are out there. All these capabilities exist. And uh, as we said before the, the break at the first part of the show, we've got to get a, a, a steward, somebody who cares enough about this to take it on, and provide them with the, uh, the, the, the basis of technology and the architecture that can tie it together and think of demonstration programs and think of get ways to get the in-state users involved so we know exactly what it is they really need and then produce something in, in the experimental domain to satisfy them. And we do it by next week. <laughs> yeah. Yesterday, we need it yesterday. Need it yesterday. <laughs> we're gonna need it yesterday really quick. As soon as we need it, we're gonna need it really quick. And so, uh, so John, this is something to think about. I'll, I'll work on GIFX if you'll work on GIFX also. And if we got a way to get to DHS and, and FEMA, I think um, I can get uh, into NFPA and a few others. And maybe what we need to do is put a white paper together, a page long yeah, white paper. Right. Here's, here's right. the thing, here's what we got to do it together. And uh, we can't solve it all on this program here on Think Tech Hawaii in one shot, but we can probably do it in two. And uh, we are approaching the end of our, of our half hour, now down to a half hour, John, from the 45 when you were on before, and I want to thank you very much for your, as usual, brilliant ideas and uh, enjoyable conversation. And, and John, with us having completed this mission, we can now discharge the state of Hawaii to go off and have its three-day weekend for July 4th. Great. Thanks a lot, John. Thank you. Okay. See you all next Friday.